Welcome to this week's Spinoza Triad, in which Dr. Richard Miller, Dan Rowland, and myself, John Gibbs, will consider another aspect of philosophy that's taken our interest. Our discussion, as always, is unscripted, and this week we consider one of the most famous philosophical propositions in the history of philosophy, that is, Plato's forms. We try, as always, to relate this philosophical proposition to something in our contemporary world, and this week we've chosen beauty, or rather cultural value. Is truth beauty, and beauty truth, as Keats observed, or is beauty purely in the eye of the beholder, a matter of opinion? Plato certainly didn't think so. Plato lived in Athens in the classical period of ancient Greece. His life from somewhere around 428 to 348 BC, a long life in which he lived to nearly 80 years, provided the origins for a school of philosophical thought, Platonism, which lasted throughout the classical world and the Roman period. For nearly 800 years and into the Christian period and to today, Platonism in its original form and its developed form as Neoplatonism has influenced thought to our present time. Plato's theory of forms, that this world is merely a shadow representation of a world of reality, a world of forms that exist beyond this world, which gives rise to an idealist school of philosophical thought. In Raphael's painting, The School of Athens, Plato is seen pointing to the heavens. To understand this world is to look beyond this world. Next to him, Aristotle, his hand held open, seems to gesture downwards to the earth suggesting that it's in this world that you'll find truth and reality. This may be an oversimplification of the differences, but certainly it represents a debate which continues to this day. Is the idea of forms, the idea of ideal perfect beauty, ideal perfect justice, of any relevance today? Certainly, our first task was to try and understand the complexity of Plato's arguments. We begin thinking about the morality of art itself, and particularly the relationship between the ethics and morality of the artist and the ethics and morality of their art, and how we should respond to those things. Does the good artist produce good art? Should art be in the pursuit of the good? Are beauty and goodness somehow related? Certainly, we don't pretend to do anything other than scratch the surface I hope it will be of interest to you. If you wish to know more about Plato, please follow our links. These are the links to some of the sites we used and looked at before we began our discussion. You can find these on our website or on the Facebook group, The Spinoza Triad. I hope you enjoy our discussion. We certainly did. I suppose the next question is, can the art be separate from the person who's created it? Mitch, you were saying that it's possible to be a pretty nasty guy, but very, very creative. I don't think it has any relevance to it. The question, perhaps, is, is what's the role of ethics within the production of art, mm. I suppose, uh, in how we value it? And the example was the, the guitar player, Bob Brosman, who I was a massive fan of, and then found out after he died that he was, well, allegedly, that he was a paedophile. And does that then affect how you engage with that piece of art, it does, it does. And this idea is part of our intellectual fabric in the sense that we imagine artists who in their pursuit of some kind of aesthetic truth must also themselves be morally virtuous. It's a surprise to us, I think, when artists or great guitarists or great uh, painters are not themselves good people. It, beca- it comes as something which seems a, a, a almost unnatural. Can it stand alone yeah, outside yeah. of the person that produces it? Does it exist of itself? Is there something which uh, which exists as itself without any reference to anything else? So there's but a separation a between the, the artist and the art that's produced. Do you know the death of the author? End at the end of meta narrative. Leotard, thank you. Yeah, Leotard. Yeah. Yeah. If in the postmodern world post you know the post postmodernity he, he coins that phrase if in postmodernity you don't care about the author the, a text exists on its own in the culture of its mm-hmm. time so that shakespeare is dead if you found out he was an awful human being or if he tells you that you completely got the meaning of one of his plays wrong it doesn't matter because your, your meaning is better than maybe better maybe it's possible you saw in the art something he didn't see art detaches itself from the author and floats off 
it then, belongs to the world, belongs to time. It doesn't exist of itself. It, it just has interpretation layered upon it through each generation. So what I was saying earlier, does art actually exist independently of interpretation as one of, let's say, pointing back to the forms and hints at what it's about through through interpretation? Yes. Or as Leotard is saying, is it just reinvented all the time with each successive generation? And that's mm. why the author doesn't matter because... The author has created this thing which is then interpreted so is it the interpretation or is it the art uh, which is more important is an art down to your experience it's it empiricist it's how you experience that art what it says to you is whether or not it's defined as we're fusing together art and beauty here does all art have to be beautiful to elicit some form of experience before we consider that question i've just got to say richard that a moment mm. ago you said the expression what is art and paused with a smile on your face yeah. That's like walking up to a cliff edge, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh dear, why did I start that thought? <laughs> why, why did I say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I did. Feel myself sweating slightly and then stop. <laughs> <laughs> what is art? I know the next step is into um, nothing. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. If we're, are we staying with beauty? observation truth is beauty and beauty is truth art if it's to be truthful has to be beautiful does it i don't think so no. i don't think oh, well, the... tracy emming's bed is is that attractive is somebody yeah. thought it was worth a few quid didn't they at one point is it... <laughs> or is it that we have a rather narrow conception of beauty and there is a beauty in the ordinary moment of someone's bed with a packet of fags laying on the side and a, a condom packet on the side <laughs> on the side and a, yeah and a sort of pair of knickers that haven't been washed for a month does... there's a kind of Doesn't... truth in that and maybe that's not beauty but it, or maybe it is maybe maybe ordinary life is beautiful again it's the the old cliche it is the beholder isn't it so it goes back to experience again doesn't it that hume we're going back to the forms plato isn't really talking about the audience and interpretation he's talking about knowledge so he's talking about something different he's saying that things can be known and we only get a hint of what is actually there. It talks about the difference between the ideal and the real. So we see the real world, but the ideal world is sitting behind the real world. Plato's talking about knowledge, and so therefore I'd say that the author is important rather than the interpretation. And so mm. as a philosopher, you've got to be trying to move towards the form of the ideal and see the ideal in the real. Knowledge, or seeking knowledge, is to realise the conditions of the ideal, even though you're in, uh, encased in a physical form. So he, he's taking quite a religious perspective in the yes. fact we're all kind of like spirits and souls that have been attached to a corporeal reality. The forms are there. We can only know the forms through what we see. The irony is, is that knowledge is not subject to sense data or empirical study, it's beyond that. Um, so it's rational, it's and it's a priori. And empiricism is the, only is the only clue we have to what reality there is behind our physical existence. It's, it's knowledge, not perception, what we were talking about earlier, about art and an, art, an artist's work living on, even though they're not very pleasant people. I think what Plato is saying is that um, the forms are the artwork of God, if you like. This can be known only through philosophical thinking and living philosophically. Can you have a form of the form? Well, can you have a form of the forms is a really good question. And in fact, it's a, it's a question that Plato himself asks himself, as it were. In his dialogue, the Parmenides, he raises a series of objections to the whole theory of forms i mean there's the there is the objection you've just raised the uh, can you have a form of the form which is described as the third man argument the third man argument something like this if there's a form of beauty there must be a form of the form of beauty and if there's a form of the form of beauty there must be a form of that form of beauty and so on it's an endless regression of forms it's a bit like the, the the world is a disc floating on the back of four elephants standing on a turtle and what's underneath the turtle well it's basically it's turtles all the way down Essentially, the third man argument is the endless regression argument. Well, he does this in the Parmenides by imaginary argument between the young Socrates and the experienced philosopher Parmenides. 
Um, Parmenides re- raises these series of objections against the forms. The third man argument, the argument of correlation between the forms and how do they interact with each other, forms and the things in this world. So does the form of beauty have a small piece of the form of beauty in every beautiful thing or does the beautiful things possess the whole of the form of beauty? How exactly do they relate to one another? And the relationship between forms and the gods. Who created the forms? Were the, the, what, that and in, indeed, what can we understand of the forms? These objections aren't answered particularly by Plato. Now, there are all sorts of debate. Oh, you know, is the Parmenides and indeed uh, the Republic and all of Plato's writing it's essentially teaching tools, kind of thought experiments in which they propose a series of problems which you aren't necessarily able to explain. Another objection to the forms that Parmenides uh, raises is the uh, the extent of the forms. Is there a form for everything? Is there a form for there's a form for beauty? There's a form for justice? We can sort of you know yes of course, of course there is an absolute an absolute perfection of beauty. But is there a um, form for dog hair? Is there a form for scum? Is there a form for dirt? Is there a form for dust? And so on. Is this answered by there being a hierarchy of forms and that the beauty and justice are are sort of universal forms of which more mundane forms possess some kind of correlation. So maybe Renaissance art was trying to point towards that ideal. You see the religious paintings of the 16th, 17th centuries, trying to point to what is actually behind what we see. Because I think that's what the forms are saying, is there's something behind everything. We can't get any idea of what that concept is unless we adopt philosophy as a way of being. Yes. Plato is saying. know what justice is but we can't exactly know it like we can know what a a square looks like we can know but we can't quite know what justice is but we make references to it so therefore because we are referring to something it's a reference point therefore it must be true that it can't be pinpointed yes they are they're they're the universal reference points that we in in some mystical way we we recall humans recall the existence of these universals so there are triangles. I could draw a triangle on a piece of paper. That's a particular triangle. But there's the idea of triangleness. That clearly exists somewhere. Right. Is it an inventive thing? Is it something I sort of conjured out of my mind and human beings simply a, a, an agreed code that these particular shapes we shall call triangle? But they all seem to have a universal property. So there seems to be, even if no humans existed, there still would be every, every angle in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. That, that would still be true whether humans existed or not. So there seems to be yeah. a universal truth to triangleness. I made a reference to geometry because geometry is more easy and more ready, readily available to know. But if you say something like beauty, we can't know beauty like we can know geometry. But we know that beauty is true because we make references to it all the time, even though we can't know what it is, really. True. We, we seem to know what it is, don't we? We seem to know, but we don't seem to know about a triangle. We know what a triangle is. So So making that jump between the universality that you can see in geometry and applying it to justice, to beauty, because if there isn't, if some things are utterly relative and just human inventions, then... That's the point. If, If everything is relative, then we shouldn't talk about justice, beauty. We shouldn't talk about things being right or wrong. We should just say there are just individual opinions. And all reference to the universal should just be binned. But then obviously we end up moving towards some kind of philosophical madness then, which we maybe mean, that's where we're at. We are there at the moment anyway. <laughs> I think it's different from geometry. I may be wrong. I, you know. Well, ri- written above the door of the academy, Plato's academy was, don't come in unless you can understand geometry. I'm wrong. <laughs> in other words, you might be right, but Plato is making a direct yeah. jump. You can just see it easier in triangleness. I think, yeah, it's something you can see, it's, which is a, it's a concept that doesn't have any physical existence, but has a reference point to... It's, an, it's a, form of, a form of ideal type, isn't it, I think? Doesn't he, uh, in Republic, talk about immortal souls? You know the forms, your soul knows them. Your soul comes into the world from the world where the souls exist, yes. and that is the world of the forms. Right, yeah. And so you, are, you come into the world recollecting some, depending on what kind of soul you have, you know, the philosophers have the souls mm. of gold. <laughs> right. and they can they can just recall a whole lot more. Whereas the, yeah. the silver and bronze souls, 
it's a bit like um, how how strong a signal you're getting on your mobile phone, and so yeah. something like that. <laughs> so certain souls are able to recall this better than others, and naturally enough, for, for for Plato, the philosophers have the best memory of the eternal and the enduring universes. Mm. So understanding the realm of the forms through philosophy. The unseen forms are things like beauty, justice, things which we know exist, but we can't see empirically. We can only see examples of these things. We we see examples of beauty. We see examples of justice, but we never see justice. But we know justice exists. A craftsman would make the perfect axe based on the ideal form of the axe, and that would make it a good axe. Whereas a bad axe would just be a copy of a physical axe. So it'd be almost like a facsimile. So someone copying an axe that they see before them, that wouldn't be as good as an axe that's been made from the concept of an axe, which is the right. ideal form of an axe. The craftsman has some rudimentary or imperfect sense of what the perfect axe could be, but it's the philosopher who reaches even higher and has some idea of the unseen truths of justice and beauty. and So I suppose the, the philosopher is approaching uh, knowledge in the same way as a craftsman making the perfect axe. Well, that's where yeah. postmodernism and Platonism would, would completely diverge because yeah. for, for postmodernism, although it, well, that seems like for the postmodern truth floats away from the author, it's purely relative. Whereas for Plato, there's, there is a truth. I, I, isn't, isn't the difference in, it, in that the Platonic philosopher is uncovering uh, sort of an yeah. a priori kind of truth? There's something there. And for the postmodernist, John, now con- it's constructed, isn't it? You- what relevance would this have for people who are brought up on a diet of only relative thinking, where they've obviously the stuff we've been talking about in the previous podcast, whereby the idea is that the individual is the, is the main, uh, main reference point for truth. I mean, does this sound like an anathema to them? This stuff yeah. of something which is true, which is existing beyond the individual, by which, which actually shapes the individual. This is very I mean, uh, difficult for modern ears. It's idealism. It's having an idea beyond the material things around you. If you mention idealism, idealism is saying there's no physical aspect to the world everything is just ideas the whole world is made of ideas even sensation touch heat the feeling well, you i think get when i think it's still pain it's just it doesn't just deny a material ideas. reality though dan does it i mean it's just suggesting i think maybe that your understanding of the material world around you starts with an idea it's not saying that, it, that it's not there oh, uh, no, no, i no, i think george berkeley george berkeley is saying that the only substance is ideas. Yeah, I think that's subjective idealism, and I think isn't it slightly different with Plato? I know I, I only I only jumped in with idealism because oh, no. you mentioned right. it. But, um, but I, I think idealism is there's no subs, material substance because everything is just based on ideas in terms of sensation. And Doc, Dr. Johnson famously says, when told of this idea, he, he kicks a stone and says that that they yeah, are that's real. <laughs> that's the end of that argument. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, if, um, yeah. but all that it can't. Hey, it, all, in fact, all, what is that famous observation on Plato that everything in philosophy for the last two thousand years is just footnotes to Plato? Yeah. So Plato's created figure, Socrates, is asking, well, what if if you live in a world of relativism, then nothing has any meaning. Then how do you account for our sense of beauty, sense of justice? Because if justice, if there's no such thing, justice is a human construct. If there's no good life, that's just a human construct. Then. Well, well, then where, where do you go with that? You go into a world of utter cynicism. So you, you end up living in a barrel or you end up not talking to people or declaring things. Anything is good and anything is bad. It's just a, just a culturally produced. Well, we don't believe that at all, do we? I think the postmodern world is moving towards that, especially post-2016. It's in this, this post-truth movement. I think there's a general movement towards the individual being the architect of their own truth which is what's causing all the anxiety and stress. And the well, confusion. it's a form of nihilism, isn't it? It's, it's totally nihilistic, yeah. Mm. And it uses the language of freedom. 
to express itself when it's actually quite incarcerating and imprisoning to leave everything to the individual because the individual can't has got no frame of reference on which to hook their lives upon do you know this is reminiscent of the one we did on um uh, Yun seems the, the sort of archetypes and forms. There's a lot of crossovers there, isn't there? There is. I think. I, I, yeah. One reading of, of the Republic, the first three books, four books, five books, are all about this ideal Republic. And then he gets on to forms after that. And uh, he creates this image of the philosopher led city, you know, philosopher kings. And one reading of that is that really the city is a metaphor for the human soul and the human mind. So actually, right. it's very early psychoanalysis. It's very early. Yeah. Set, you know, so it's Plato That's saying the well-ordered city is simply a construct of the well-ordered mind. It has to contain, uh, you know, there are passions. That's the artists. There are, there's aggression. That's the soldiers, the uh, superego or whatever. That, that might be the philosophers. And so in mm, a yeah. sense, Plato, that's why everything, you can you can almost go bring most streams of Western thought back to Plato in some. Yeah. What do you mention yeah. Kant earlier? I mean, that, that's a similar. Kant's, similar... An argument. Kant's arguing with Plato. Yeah. He's trying to he's trying to say if not if there isn't a metaphysical ethereal world projecting into this world in some way through our memories if that isn't true then mm. maybe we humans can project onto the world universal truths categorical imperatives he's arguing with Plato but going back to what you were saying Dan there's mm. another strand in popular culture at the moment although nihilism and relativism strong strands in post kind of postmodern thought there are, mm. a lot of young people today are quite vehement about fairly universal forms of truth to be quite intolerant to other forms. You know, for instance, being, being intolerant of certain political views that are considered non-politically correct or insulting or threatening. So curiously, there are more rules around about what you can say now than there were when I was, when I would have in conversations in the 1970s. Oh, definitely, yeah. But John, they, they're around uh, emotional states rather than reasonable states because the language used is I'm taking offence rather than your argument is wrong because. So often there's no, and then you have that cancel culture whereby it's yeah, like cancel. kids sticking their, sticking their fingers in their ears saying, I'm not listening to you. So taking yeah. offence is an emotional response to uh, an argument. And therefore what's happening in this post-truth world is nobody's, de- nobody's listening to anyone. Nobody's talking. Nobody's discussing. Everyone's taking a position, but nobody knows what they're talking about. There's no reference point. There's no universal except emotional outrage. That's a good critique of council, council culture. And well, I, remember, I remember my dad's quoting George Bernard Shaw. If you listen to something you don't agree with, you say, I completely disagree with you, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. He had a very big view of free speech. The most offensive thing was a thing you could argue with. So well, that's not true today. But that partly because if someone says, well, that's racist or that's offensive, they mean it's wrong. It's fundamentally not correct. It's, it's changed from truth. The example you just used there, John, it's, it's because you, you have a right to try and arrive at, at a truth as opposed to belief. Now, it's more important that, that we have a consensus of belief and it's more important to us or I mean, within this culture that we're in at the moment. It's more important that, that people believe the same thing and you believe the same as me. And we all believe that, you know, you must believe the same as I do, as opposed to we must try and access the truth. It's, it's a shift. A belief has replaced reason. However, I also think it's quite important not to fall into an overly romantic view of the past where, you know, the 1970s or 80s or some period like that were incredibly tolerant, where anything could be said in open debate and we were unoffended by things. And then in the evening, because we sat down and watched the Black and White Minstrel show on evening of Jim Will Fix It with Jimmy Savile, there was an awful lot of hypocrisy and hidden violence in the past that is is exposed by by an understanding of offence and what causes offence. Uh, and I think that's tremendous improvement, really, in the liberalism and liberal tolerance was often used to mask quite repressive attitudes, particularly towards women in the 1950s and 1960s, which is now beginning to realise that the, the freedoms of the time were often another way of masking uh, oppression. So in a sense, we can't have it both ways and accuse the contemporary times of being a nihilistic void of relativism and at the same time flaky and insisting on being on on taking offence too easily. The pursuit of truth is really quite a noble enterprise. If I could bring this back 
in a sense, to the beginning of where we started. Our discussion of Plato's forms began initially with a discussion of the morality of, of artists. Why should we expect the artist to possess some kind of moral virtue? And I think that's because the pursuit of truth, as it was conducted by the classical philosophers, was a pursuit of an understanding of what beauty was, what virtue or the good life was, and what justice was. And I think justice, virtue and beauty were seen as aspects of the same thing. They were deeply connected with each other. And the artist, in their pursuit of some kind of perfection of beauty, was also expressing justice and also expressing the good life. And I think you can see that in classical architecture, in the understanding of the proportions of the, of the classical beautiful face, of the beautiful life and how you should live your life according to order and proportion and balance and symmetry. And this can be found in architecture, can be found in art and can be found in the concepts of beauty themselves. Truth and beauty coexisted much more emphatically for the classical philosophers than I think it does today. We, I think, in contemporary society, although we've been pursuing these ideas for 2,000 years in philosophy, in contemporary society, I think we are altogether more comfortable with our understanding of justice than we are with our understanding of virtue and how to live the virtuous life. I think we're much more, much more inclined to be uncertain about what virtue and the ethical society might be. But justice, I think, or the ethics of justice, we're more certain about. Be beauty, I, I would guess, we are altogether at sea with. The aesthetics of art, uh, we're at a loss. As we said earlier, you step into a void in our, in our contemporary society when you consider art, but we have reached some kind of idea of justice, whether it's a natural justice or whether it's um, human rights or a concept of that which beyond which you should not go. The boundaries of justice are altogether more certain to us. And I would guess that in the classical world, the, re the reverse was true. I think they understood beauty and they understood virtue more clearly than they understood justice. And I think they would have been less clear constructed a just society. And I think much of much of Plato's Republic is concerned with the construction of a just society because they found that topic to be so difficult. Whereas beauty, I would imagine, was altogether more certain for them. In the Republic, the parable of the Ring of Gyges, he proposes a thought experiment which is designed to make you question your ideas of justice. In the Ring of Gyges, a man finds a ring. The ring gives him the power of invisibility. That sounds like Lord of the Rings. So one of the, it's oh. one of the consequences of the Ring of Gyges that the, that the person feels no guilt as well for any actions they create, even though they remain invisible and they would have no consequences to face. <laughs> it's called Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Richard's point is... It's a good one. Is it though? Is the ring of gauges, therefore, uh, the internet and all the anonymity that's offered through all the, the nonsense that's posted? Are people acting as if they're wearing the ring of gauges. The more famous story, the more famous story is that there's a cave, and in the cave, there are people who are. We're yep. chained. You know, you'd know this one, don't you? Mm. They're chained so they can't turn their heads and they're staring at a wall. Behind them, there's a fire. People are moving between the fire and them. YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's a, and, that's a, and that's human life. That, that what we live in a world of shadow. So all this is yep. just a world of shadow. And the real world is something we can't see. Beyond the cave. It's outside the cave. It's beyond the cave. It's beyond our heads. And then what happens is obviously someone frees themselves, unbreaks the chains climbs out of the cave, sees the sunlight, which is wisdom, then goes back in and tells his mates, hey, guys, this isn't real. And, of course, nobody Turn your phones off. They yeah. carry, on, sta they carry on staring at the shadows on the wall, no saying this is reality. So, so the forms, we're only looking at the shadows of the forms. We live in a world of shadow. When an artist tries to carve somewhere in his memory, the artist, probably because he's got a gold, a silver or a gold soul, is trying to get to the form. Because the word form actually just comes from the form that sculptors used, where they would carve a wooden version of the thing, and then they would use that to carve onto the stone. Right. So it's, a, it's the model on which. So we're striving all the time. We're striving. We're hungry. Those of us with, with more, uh, more memory than the others, those are struggling to get to the universal. We can probably ne we can never do it, 
but some will do it more than others and the philosophers will do it best of all. Okay, but it, the most important thing is the struggle, not the outcome. Yeah, although in the city led by the philosophers, the philosophers live in sort of like monasteries, as it were, on their own. They're not allowed to own property. They're not allowed to marry. They're not allowed to have any material wealth, material distractions or material yeah. wealth. They're not allowed to be corrupted. They okay. they make all the decisions. The people who, who the, the traders and the builders and the makers uh, obey them. But also you bring the soldiers, the sort of soldier class up in a very strict way. It's almost like it is a very fascistic sounding state. He didn't like democracy. No, he democracy. was an elitist, wasn't he? A total elitist. Yeah. Well, the Democrats had put Socrates to death. Popular democracy had condemned, had condemned Socrates as a nasty old corrupter of youth. Plato, City of Philosophers, there's curiously little room actually for art. Plato seems to see art as both as an imitation of an imitation. Since the world itself is an imitation of the world of forms, art simply imitates the imitation. Yeah. So it's doubly false or doubly removed from purity and ideal. So the artist doesn't seem to figure well in Plato's city of the philosopher kings right although plato does warn in the republic that the ordinary folk or youth for that matter should be kept well away from certain types of art art can be corrupting art can lead to certainly you should be very careful what sort of art you allow people to have the people being probably the non-philosophers so it's a very elitist view of art but not one that's a million miles away from the way we believe today we certainly censor the kind of art that children can look at we censor the kind of things that children can see and stories that can be told. Okay. And we, not unlike Plato, have a somewhat elitist view that, of art itself. Art is in a world of sort of esoteric navel gazing, kept far away from people. I think a debate he's going to begin in the Republic is going to continue with the sense that democracies don't produce great art, that democracies uh, will produce the sort of debased popular art. And today we, we see sort of debased popular art is not the stuff taught for GCSE English students, the canon of English literature, acceptable texts that are taught in the schools, that which we consider to be great art is strongly presented in our education system and the values of our society. And art gallery going is generally the occupation of a certain educated elite people. Art galleries up and down Britain are mainly frequented by the middle classes and educated classes. It will be a view of ordinary people that art has little to say that, that, that they can identify with. We will, I suspect, feel, along with Plato, that great art isn't produced by democracy. Unlike Plato, I think we also would worry, conversely, that very sterile art can be produced by authoritarian regimes. Just to take one glance at the kind of approved art in Stalinist Russia or the approved art in Hitler's Germany or that art which is considered safe or uh, okay uh, pretends to be bland and sterile. Indeed the Greeks themselves you can accuse Greek and Roman world of producing an awful lot of art that was very similar said a lot about power and authority but, but it was endlessly reproducing similar sorts of ideas. On the other hand, we also can accept that the art of the elites can also be art, as I said, of um, introspection and esoteric, um, squeezing the sunlight out of cucumbers, like the philosophers on the flying island of, you know, of, of Gulliver's Travels. It seems to be searching for something uh, utterly divorced from the lives of ordinary people. That is, in a sense, why Tracy Yemen's bed is an art which attempts to connect with the lives of ordinary people. I but, but I think in so doing, paradoxically, it doesn't and probably a little bit incomprehensible and a, and, a bed, and a messy bed is simply not going to be, for most people, art and beauty. Well, where, where that takes you is, is, is there any place today for universal truth? Or is universal hmm. truth... Well, I think the first question is, why have we moved so violently away from universal truths and we think that anything universal can't be trusted to the point where the biggest moral virtue in the modern world today is non-judgment i think though dan it's really that shift again the universals now isn't truth it's belief and it and it's really the other's belief that's of interest yeah what john has outlined though is, is that these things exist whether we like them or not the forms are in existence right. And part of the human experience is trying to move towards them. If you start to saying it's belief, it's then 
opening up a realm of faith and religion, not reason and knowledge. You can't know something that you believe because you believe it. So therefore, you can't have a position of truth. You might feel it's true, but you can't. It's not a universal truth. It's you know, it's true to you. I'm quite interested in the idea whereby, obviously, there were universal moral truths in the ancient world that talked about justice and beauty that were not relative, that were absolute, and any judgment that was formed was moving towards them. Now we and judgment was seen as a good thing because it was meaning you were moving towards those good things. But now the greatest moral virtue is non-judgment so therefore we don't have any indicators to find our way forward except just continue in this morass of belief but isn't there a last couple of hundred years also a strand of liberalist universality so for instance things like we hold these truths to be self-evident thomas jefferson is saying there are certain truths that are just opted they are true because they're true because they're true they're not they're not constructs of the human mind or anything all men are created equal. The philosopher John Rawls, The Veil of Ignorance. Mm. The Veil of Ignorance, if you're going to step into the world and you couldn't know what you'd be in that world, what kind of world would mm. you construct so that it was fair to the weakest? He says, mm. well, that's a, it's a universal form of justice. I don't know where, he's not going to say it comes from the forms, but it's universally true that a society would be best that treats the weakest fairest. Of course. Yeah. That's a sort of universal Self, truth. That's self-evidently true. and I, and I And... So so when the U.S. Constitution says self-evidently true, you're arguing that that's moving towards one of a form of one of Plato's forms, because, again, you can't quite touch it. You can't see it, but you just know it's true. Yeah. Well, unless you're Neoplatonist or Christian or going to going if you're going to take a metaphysical view and say that these come from beyond us. But even if you don't take that and you take a very sort of materialist view. Mm. So, I mean, Hegel is going to do this, isn't he? Hegel is going to do it to history. Marx yeah. is going to do it. Marx is going to say there's there's a way in which the world is working. And we these aren't human beings deciding this. This this sort of this sort of operates in nature. Then what happens? You have what's called a meta narrative, obviously, which is trying to explain everything like Hegel and explaining history. And since the 60s, there's been a mistrust of the meta narrative because the meta narrative became too powerful because it resulted in empire conquest and suppression and so and that's completely understandable but now i think we've perhaps thrown everything away because of what happened in the past to the point that we don't quite know where our reference points are anymore there are no more meta narratives as of any any philosophy will not put a meta narrative forward at all, be it Marxism, Hegelianism. The only meta narrative that's really operating now, that's governing all lives, that remains hidden, is capitalism. That's the one meta narrative that's never questioned. I know you're going to call me a mad lefty now, but yeah. No, I, I agree. I, I, no. I just postmodern condition is the end of meta narrative. Except, except capitalism. Except capitalism. Although Jefferson has that covered as well, which he describes as the pursuit of happiness. Among the other truths that are self-evident is that human beings will pursue material happiness. Well, that's capitalism for you, which is, as you say, Dan, the dominant meta-narrative of our times. Which is a mystery. Why is capitalism never questioned? Even justice is questioned. Human rights are questioned. Well, the thing is, Dan, are, are human rights questioned? Because at the same time as we've seem to... Have, well, they know, are. The, the, the right are always questioning, saying that human rights are responsible for... That legislation are responsible for all sorts of irregularities. And Even those nutty right winger, though, is never going to argue that we should bring back slavery or the, or the gladiatorial arena. We have moved on from that, as it were. So slavery or... We might argue that... that but there's going to be... We're going to go back to what we said last week about sort of negative rights and positive mm-hmm. rights... And, and liberals are going to argue for positive rights, the right to education, the right to whatever. The right is going to argue for negative rights, the right to own a gun and to do as you please under the under your own sky. But none of this, they're all arguing from a point of view of some kind of definition of freedom. The difference is in this post-truth world is they're not concerned with a universal. They're concerned with a particular. They're concerned with a particular perspective or viewpoint or interest rather than this is a universal, going back to the US Constitution, it's self-evidently true. We don't hear those phrases anymore. So you just have factional interest. 
putting their views forward. And it's those voices that are the loudest and have the most most about, resources. So it's not because it's universal. Re- references to universal forms, as Plato puts forward, are just not seen anymore in this post-truth, post-modern world. You mentioned about the dominance of capitalism, Dan, and more likely to, uh, what is it, a meteor hitting the earth, you know, and that we go out, you know, fire rockets up and blast the meteor out of the sky. You're more likely to believe that than you are a viable alternative to capitalism now. And, and it's from that, that, and why is that? Is the, remember the book I posted the other week, the Mark Fisher book, Capitalist Realism? Absolutely fantastic. But re- it's a very short book. And, and in that, he starts, he, he goes into more detail about uh, how and why and, and what mechanisms have been in place of the naturalization yeah. of dominant ideology of capitalism. Yeah. How does that relate back to form? I only raised it because I think that we have a, we live in an age of mistrust when we look at universal positions. And the stuff that Plato was referring to is a universal perspective on the human condition that is yeah, mysterious. I, could, I think, couldn't you argue? We don't refer to these points anymore. We, I don't the, the know. Individual... I don't think we refer to them in, meta, in a metaphysical sense. I mean, I don't think religious people do. Society is in some sort of progressive transformation towards something better. Well, we're, you know, whether, whether you believe it gets that it's got there already or it's going to get there one day of the socialist utopia, or whether we there is implicit in modernity a platonic sense of there being a world better than this one and we can make it here. I'm going to throw in a bit of Zizek there on that point. Is I think, yes, there is this universal, perhaps, belief in equality, but there's no real impunction to actually live it. Uh, Zizek makes all these references to modern life about, you know, life being emptied of substance, like, you know, smoking without smoking or coffee yeah. without cream, all this kind of yeah. thing. I think you have equality, which is unfair or, you know, uh, equality that's not real equality if people really wanted equality then they would be wanting to go without everyone's equal so long as it doesn't affect my life mate you know i feel it's most uh, apparent when we look at environmental stuff and you know yeah. in order to, to change individuals have to make well you know significant sac- sacrifices on our day-to-day living but nobody really wants to at the same time. I mean, little, little yeah. you know, pay lip service to this or, or do this, but Zizek's point, it's zo- zoological exactly. ethics, he called it, didn't yes. he? You know, it's, yeah. it's okay from afar. You know, if I donate two pounds to whatever it could be, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, I get a nice warm, fluffy feeling and I feel I've contributed to something, but in actual fact, I've just carried on And the, the whole same. point is it's serving your warm, fluffy feeling, which is a feeling again, not a moral impunction. Well, it's just a feeling. Okay. Um, and you get that little buzz, that little feeling. And then you carry on with your lifestyle that is further perpetuating inequality. If we put our coffee cup in a recycling bin rather than throwing it in the other bin, we've done our bit. Or we buy well, organic coffee beans rather than well, the, the, the cheaper coffee beans. You know, in a just, sense, though, Dan, the trouble with that argument, well, the trouble with that, it's a very good argument, but the trouble with that argument might be that if that's true, that what Zizek is doing, what Marxists are doing, what the left is doing, what Except someone like Alt- Altazer did, mm. ideological state apparatus. Well, there's no way out from that, he says. You know, it infuses every part of our lives. So, that, so capitalism creates illusions, ways in which we can fool ourselves. And we're all ultimately going to going along, you know, we're all going over the waterfall together kind of thing. Except mm. Altazer's not, because, or he didn't, he, I know he went nut off his head and all that. How come some people can see this? You know, going back to Plato again, Plato's arguing that, yes, most people are pretty stupid, but the good person, i.e. the philosopher, can see their way around this. If we're sitting having this conversation and other people having this conversation, by some slow incremental process, we're moving towards the city on the hill, the better better society. So have Plato's forms in our discussion helped us to understand exactly what beauty is? Definitely to make an aesthetic judgment is the aesthetic value. Is what value do you place upon beauty? What's the, the scale by which, of what degree is something beautiful? But if you're leaving it down to the audience or the interpreter, is, is knowledge possible? Can you then say, I can know what beauty is? 
by looking at an example of something that I find beautiful. Do, do you think, though, Dan, do you need knowledge? I mean, is, is beauty not an emotional response? Though? For me to listen to music and, and think, what well, that's beautiful, or, or, or a view, or, or anything, really, any type jaguar. <laughs> Uh, you know, is it is it beautiful because it surely is it is a, an emotional response. It doesn't have I, I argue it doesn't have to be knowable or reasonable. If you stand on the mountain top and look at the sunrise coming over the, the Alps yeah. and you, you are yeah. filled with a strange sense of awe and wonder and joy and all these things, they could be but fairly banal emotions. They're just it's a big thing. A sensory overload. I mean, if, if I want to see something beautiful and then kill it, all I need is some philosopher go got in my ear about my rational reasoned response to it. Is it not a universal where an object has both its physical dimension, its its thing that it is there? Let's let's say the view again, use an example. There is a view, there is an object of the view, um, but it's partial insofar as we we pad it out with our, our experience of it, it there's some fantasy dimension to it as well which make which gives it an imaginative story or something so it, it's never quite complete in itself which is the incomplete object which is then padded out through fantasy is kind of a contradiction against plato because it's not perfection it's actually beauty is found in the imperfection so so it's never in, entire or fulfilled so it doesn't have to i don't think it has to be either universal platonic model versus complete relativism there is also a, an acceptance of there being things that aren't that aren't perfect that never can be but these partial objects are then padded out with a fantasy that make it complete if you love an object is it you know beautiful in some respects but very often your love is a product of you making that thing whole so it, it does rely on the individual and an emotive response to a certain extent but it doesn't mean that everything, therefore, has to be relative because there still is an object. There still is the, the, the thing itself. There still is a, a kind of form, if you like. You have been listening to another discussion by the Spinoza Triad. Dr. Richard Miller, Dan Rowland and myself, John Gibbs. I think in the end, we did arrive at some kind of conclusion. After much consideration of Plato and beauty and forms, maybe Richard's final observation that imperfection and human emotion and this material world produce our understanding of beauty. Well, if you enjoyed our discussion, please share this on social media, visit our website, or look at the Facebook group, The Spinoza Triad. Next week, and in subsequent weeks, we'll be considering such diverse topics as the Squid Game and the religious origin of creativity. Next week, I'll be interviewing the author, Linda Sager, as an expert on screenwriting and advisor to many major film productions and television productions. As a director, a theatre director, a writer, we interview her next week on her new book, God's Part in Our Art, Making Friends with Creativity. Join us then, hopefully in the not-too-distant future. <laughs>